Right, uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, the second meeting in uh, 2013 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Uh, welcome to our witnesses this morning who are joining us. And can I remind everyone please to turn off their mobile phones and other uh, electrical devices. Uh, item one on the agenda, uh, can I ask committee members if they uh, can agree to take item four uh, in uh, private? Yes, agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, item two on the agenda is a continuation of our inquiry into underemployment in Scotland. And we are this morning uh, in a round table format taking evidence from uh, five uh, different organisations uh, as part of this investigation. I, I suggest probably the easiest thing to do is if we just go around the table and introduce ourselves and say who we are and where we're, we're from. Um, I'll, I'll start. Uh, Murdo Fraser, I'm uh, uh, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife, and I'm the committee convener. And I'll hand over to Dennis. Uh, good morning. I am Dennis Robertson. I'm deputy convener uh, of this committee, and I'm the MSP for Aberdeenshire West. I'm James Alexander. I'm senior policy manager for the Scottish Council for Development and Industry. Mike McKenzie, um, MSP for Highlands and Islands Region. Jake Brody, MSP for South of Scotland. I'm Patrick Watt from Skills Development Scotland. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands MSP. Stephen Boyd from the Scottish TUC. Margaret Medjugal, MSP for the West Region. David Torrance, MSP for Cody Constituency. Um, my name is Leslie Giles and I'm one of the Deputy Directors from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. Marco Biaggi, MSP for Edinburgh Central Constituency. Good morning, I'm Paul Sissons from the Work Foundation. Alison Johnson, MSP for Lothian. And the others here are the official reporters who are writing things down and uh, our uh, team of clerks. Um, right, um, we've just had, um, as, as members of the committee, we've just had an interesting private briefing from uh, Scottish Government statisticians on the rate of underemployment in Scotland. Um, one of the things that came out of that, um, which was quite interesting, was um, the fact that there, there's no evidence that underemployment is in any way a unique Scottish phenomenon. Uh, the, the, the figures in Scotland are pretty much an equivalent to the rest of the UK, although the UK figures are higher than Europe as a whole. And we did hear some evidence last week from Professor David Bell around that, who said that, that this is a feature of the UK economy that's different from some other uh, European economies, although there are other European economies, such as Spain, which was the example he quoted, where unemployment rates are much higher but underemployment rates are lower. So there may be some uh, connection between the two. In order to get to, 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 to kick things off, I mean, I was, I was interested reading the submission, particularly the one from the, the, the STUC, which I thought was very, very uh, thorough piece of work, uh, looking at the, the rate of increase in underemployment. Or maybe I could just start off by, by inviting Stephen Boyd, if he would say something about that. And in particular, um, the underlying reasons for the, the rise in under, underemployment. And, and I was also interested to, to read from the STUC submission how in relation to the, the rest of the UK, although there's not much difference in underemployment rates changing compared to the rest of the UK, there have been uh, in Scotland uh, steeper declines in total employment than any other part of the UK and steeper increases in ILO unemployment than other parts of the UK. And see if we can get an understanding of some of the reasons behind that. So, Stephen. Well, sir, I mean, regarding your first point about Scotland and uh, its performance relative to the rest of the UK and indeed the rest of Europe, it's difficult, I think, not to repeat the explanation provided by David Bell last week, and I've had an opportunity to read the evidence. I mean, David spoke about the different regulatory frameworks and the different structure of the labour market in various nations, and he described the UK as having the third least stringently regulated labour market in the OECD nations, indeed the OECD and uh, other developed nations. And I think this is true. I mean, I think the degree of the flexibility in the uh, UK economy has enabled companies to retain or hold labour that otherwise they would have dispensed with. And I think that is what you've seen happen in other nations. I think ultimately whether or not this is a good or bad thing and whether or not we have that balance correct is a, an argument that I think we could have all day and probably still not come to a conclusion. Regarding the, some of the other trends that we highlighted in our labour market report uh, that we published in October and we've provided evidence again as part of our submission for today, I mean, it's just tremendously difficult 
frankly, I mean, I think I noticed David a couple of times last week gave an evidence quite uh, happily said that he wasn't entirely sure what he thinks had happened. Well, this is an occasion I'm going to do exactly the same thing. We've highlighted these trends. There's clearly been some kind of trade-off between Scotland relative to the UK. There seems to have been a, a greater propensity in Scotland to uh, certainly various stages of uh, the recession since 2008 to let people go in the rest of the UK there seems to have been a greater propensity to, to hold rather than make redundant but I think it would be you know, very possible to over exaggerate these trends. I mean I don't think you've seen the Scottish and UK labour markets diverge to a hugely significant degree. Thank you. I mean the one thing that's been interesting I think from the point of view of members is, is we've already only really skimmed the surface of the subject, but it, it's clear that uh, there are still a lot of uh, unknowns in relation to this issue, and, and I think you know we're keen to try and probe these as best best we can. Um, maybe I could ask um, James, you know, from a from a perspective of, of, of an organisation representing some employers, for an employer's context in relation to underemployment and. and you know, why is you being used as a tool by employers more than in the past? Um, thank you, Convener. I think underemployment is, 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 a, is a challenging issue. And I suppose um, SCDI's uh, our submission, our, our first point is unemployment is for us a bigger issue than underemployment. But underemployment remains a, a significant issue both for uh, for employers, for individuals and for the economy. Um, we've considered two types of underemployment. I know time under, or time hours worked underemployment was uh, uh, a key part of the, the, the ILO definition and something the committee was looking at. Um, and whilst that is a, is, a, is a concern for us as an organisation, um, and I think what we've seen uh, over the last, since, since 2008 really, is employers, um, I think it was described by David Bell as labour hoarding, but certainly um, looking at trying to keep uh, the skills in their in their workforce as far as possible, and that's that's clearly uh, important for when the upturn comes. But I think what we've also seen is employers working in in a way that hasn't been seen in previous recessions with their workforces, with the unions, um, to try and find ways of avoiding making redundancies and looking at um, are there opportunities to. Um, perhaps for everybody to collectively work fewer hours, but to keep more people in employment. Now, clearly, that therefore creates underemployment, but doesn't create as much unemployment. So, so it's something that I think we would all be uh, supportive of. Um, in terms of skill underemployment, and that's uh, the other side of the coin, and I know that Scotland has, had a, has, has been debating the issue of skills utilisation for, for many years, much before 2008, um, and I think skills utilisation is still remains a challenge more acutely now than ever before. Um, we have, in Scotland, very um, good, uh, a very positive education sector, but what that's not feeding through is that those skills being used in the workplace and delivering the economic benefit that we would expect to see from that. And I think um, we need to do much more research and get more information, particularly through the labour market statistics, of where skills are being used and, crucially, where skills have been uh, um, through investment by both the public sector and others and, 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 and in terms of individuals and their time. Um, people have acquired skills but they're not being used and they're not delivering for them the benefit that they would expect to see or indeed the benefit for the economy that we would expect to see and of course that flows through to employers as well and clearly employers have to look at the skills within their own workforce um, but I think there's 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 a, a range of work that needs to be done to use the skills in Scotland more effectively. I, I should have said earlier if anybody wants to contribute at any point just just catch my eye and uh, and, and I'll try and, and, and bring you in. Um, Paul Sissons, from the point of view of the Work Foundation, there's something that you would like to to, to, to contribute to here in, in relation to you know, the impact that underemployment has on the workforce? I mean, I think, <clears throat> um, just picking up on the last point, uh, in terms of what's been happening in, in this recession, and it might be useful to think about how this recession might be slightly different from previous recessions. And one of the things that's different is um, wages have behaved quite differently. So real wages um, have fallen over the last four years. Um, and that, that trend wasn't apparent in the 90s or the 80s. Um, but I think the whole, you know, the whole infrastructure around employment services has changed quite a lot as well. Um, so in terms of uh, people matching back into the labour market more quickly if they become unemployed, actually we've seen that, you know, that's a bit quicker. It seems to be a bit quicker this time around. So people are, you know, people are taking jobs, you know, the jobs that are available, even if they are on you know, part-time hours. And I think that's, that's perhaps slightly different. 
Leslie Giles, maybe from the point of view of, of, of skills, I mean, is there an opportunity here for people who are underemployed to develop greater skills in the time that's available to them? Yeah, I mean, from the Commission's perspective, I think that the um, importance of looking at underemployment is that, um, as people have already kind of alluded, um, you know, I think it is a kind of natural feature of the labour market, but what's particularly interesting about uh, the issue at the moment is the, the, the fact it's, you know, increasing and trying to, to, to think of the, um, the reasons for that. Um, and I think that um, there are kind of two aspects to it, really. There's a kind of supply-side dimension and, and a demand-side dimension. And I think on the supply side, it certainly does come down to the, the personal circumstances and, and, and skill sets of the individuals that are looking for jobs. And so I think in that sense, there is an important role. Um, for um, you know, employment and skills services to, to try and work with those individuals to, to help them overcome um, those kind of dimensions. So what we think is probably happening there is that because people perhaps um, have um, don't have the necessary skill sets, employers might take them on, but they're more likely to take them on in kind of part-time work while they're trying them out. Um, I think it's a phenomenon that um, we're quite concerned about, is particularly um, affecting education leavers, young people coming out of the ed education system. Um, and from our um, research, I think you know employer, employers are particularly concerned about their lack of work experience, um, and, and that's a, a dimension of that. And, and certainly there's more to do there in terms of trying to encourage placements, types of schemes that are going to enhance those, um, um, you know, sort of plat basic platform skills and experience that some of those young people have. So that's a whole host of issues on the, on the supply <coughs> side, if you like. I think there is also this issue that, again, we've already, um, earlier speakers have already started to talk around um, in terms of the demand side. And that's, you know, it's all well and good, <laughs> um, you know, trying to raise qualification level levels and so on. But what are the management practices, the business models that businesses business is using? and are they really going to put those skills to good use um, within the workplace? Are they going to have the confidence to develop their businesses, particularly in these very harsh economic times? And that um, un uncovers a whole host of, of wider issues there. Um, that certainly we've been doing some work within the Commission to look at and see, you know, what ways can you actually enhance business confidence um, and uh, in that dimension you're kind of looking into wider sort of business barriers um, that then, you know, underemployment becomes a kind of symptom of that, that broader sort of um, business challenge that businesses are going through. A couple of members have indicated they want to come in, but before that I'm just going to ask um, Patrick if he would say something about this issue about the supply side skills and you know how, how we make sure that, that those who are currently underemployed are are skilled up so they can play a full contribution in the in the workforce yeah um, I mean I suppose um, from Stephen's submission and from David Bell's argument I mean the STU submission says that the best solution to underemployment is a stimulus to increase the demand for labor David Bell's argument the fundamental challenge is that there's simply not enough demand for labour currently in the Scottish economy, and I don't think in that way we're any different from the UK, as Stephen said. Looking at the evidence, if you look at the Scottish Employer Skills Survey from 2010, attracting appropriately skilled staff is the seventh-ranked challenge for business, behind things like cash flow, attracting and retaining customers, the economic downturn, and increased costs and prices. So the supply of appropriately skilled staff, of course, is hugely important, but there are other things that are also hugely important. In terms of underemployment, the two dimensions that the committee is looking at, the underemployment in terms of hours, and I think we've got some very good evidence on that, underemployment in terms of skills, possibly less so. If we look at the Scottish employer survey that the UK Commission produced, and, and, and Leslie can uh, provide more detail on this, I'm sure, but what that says is that, and, and I quote the word drastic, it says there's been a drastic decrease in hard to fill vacancies from 37,000 in 2006 to just over 10,000 in 2011, and that the number of skills shortages in Scotland has dropped from around 23,000 in 2006 to fewer than 8,000 in 2011. So skill shortage is hugely important, you know, the current uh, energy, oil and gas, engineering and so on, the bite, where they occur, they bite, but they've dropped substantially. So what that survey says is, it says that by and large the labour market is meeting the employer's demand for skills, and it does have some evidence in the UK survey that says 
that the underuse of skills, and I'm quoting here, the research suggests that the underuse of skills affects a significantly larger proportion of employers and their workforce than skills deficiencies do. So in terms of looking at underemployment, yes, there may be issues around skills, but I would say that probably the bigger issue is on the demand side. Yeah, well, with your indulgence, uh, convener, I'll be a bit controversial, maybe, and play devil's advocate. Um, you know, James was saying, and I think there's been a bit of discussion uh, about um, underemployment being a perfectly rational and reasonable response to the decrease in demand, um, where with you know employers and um, labour forces almost by mutual consent saying rather than pay people off let's just reduce ours um, the what what concerns me or or, or what, what what would uh, um, suggest maybe though is that in attempting to um, minimize the pain in that kind of sense um, Perhaps, and, and in the lowering of demand, and I think you pointed out that the real wages have fallen, obviously underemployment, one of the big effects is that incomes drop and therefore, you know, demand has lowered. Um, are we not perhaps consigning ourselves to this flatlining economy? Um, we're maybe looking at a triple dip recession. And, and in a sense, and this is maybe very controversial, but... Is there a sense in which we're not allowing this kind of creative destruction of capitalism to actually work? Um, the, you know, the Icelanders really, I don't know if they've got thistles or nettles, but nettles, but whatever jaggy plants they've got, they really grasp them and their economy's now grown again at 3%. Um, so um, is this a good response in terms of uh, bringing on a recovery or maybe is it impeding the recovery? Well, that's a very broad uh, question to throw into the mix. Um, I don't know. We would like to pick that one up, Stephen. Well, I'm happy to start. I, mean, I think it introduces a whole range of issues there. But, uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, what, I mean, there's a kind of fallacy of composition problem here. I mean, yes, underemployment or labour holding can be a, a rational response at the level of the individual firm. If more and more firms start doing the same thing, then it becomes a huge macroeconomic problem, and it does play into the deficiency and demand we have at the moment. Um, just touch on, I mean, you mentioned the words mutual consent. Now, I think James also referred to this as well, underemployment as a sort of joint employer-employee initiative to meet the, uh, the problem, immediate problems of the recession. And I think that has certainly been the case, particularly in the very early days in the recession. You've seen some very specific examples in Scotland. Alexander Dennis is probably the best one. And clearly, we all know it's hugely successful at this moment in time. In 2008, it was an imminent risk of going bust, and the employees went to, I think, a two-and-a-half-day week. Very difficult to negotiate, but they did work together. They came to that solution. But in many, many workplaces, many of them not unionised, of course, majority of workplaces will not be unionised. What we are seeing is arbitrary cuts in working hours. I mean, the last time I visited a Citizens Advice Bureau in East Wilbride, they were telling me that well, that was in the early part of last year. The single most common reason people were coming to them at that moment time was not redundancy, it was arbitrary cuts in working hours, you know, and this was leading to financial problems, which was leading them to seek uh, advice for the uh, Citizens Advice Bureau. So we shouldn't overplay, I don't think, the consensual approach here is, you know, when it can be done, it's hugely important, and I think we should all welcome it, but I mean, I think, you know, we should recognise that much of this is hardly consensual. In terms of the creative destruction, we were talking just before we came in about Robert Peston writing yesterday about, you know, we should welcome the demise of HM, HMV for precisely that reason. You know, we're losing our other zombie company, which was one of his braver uh, pieces, I think, to, to put on the website. Uh, I think there's a, a huge debate to be had there. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of cynical. I mean, there's been much in the Financial Times recently about this as well. But what we need to see is banks been much harder and, you know, really beginning to call in their loans. I mean, at this moment in time, without you know the banks then beginning to lend to companies that are doing, you know, are doing better at this moment in time, then I, you know I feel to see that you're sort of ridding yourself of all these zombie companies is going to precipitate a robust demand-led recovery. James, do you want to jump? Uh, just, just a, I suppose a general point on on, on the economy and growth. Uh, SCDI, our objective as an organisation since uh, the 1930s is to create sustainable economic prosperity for Scotland. That's what we work towards. Um, we're, we're, we're working to build the economy with a, a wide range of stakeholders from across Civic Scotland. That includes employers and, and, and big businesses and small businesses, but also trade unions and charities and others. And, um, 
we, we want to see the economy grow by uh, uh, a whole range of mechanisms, for example, uh, increasing our exports, uh, which a lot of Scottish companies we, we believe can move more in towards uh, exporting, and uh, clearly that would have a positive benefit for the economy. We want to see improvements in infrastructure, we want to see um, uh, um, our, our connectivity improved across Scotland. So there are, there are ways that we're working uh, uh, across uh, to, to influence the economic growth agenda, uh, and skills uh, uh, comes into that as a, re a really key part of that. Um, doesn't answer your question, I suspect, at all, but so certainly we are working towards growth, and I know that uh, across Scotland there is uh, uh, this as SEDI, an organisation that is working to create growth, um, which should try and, uh, if, if we're successful, tackle some of the challenges that of underemployment and unemployment that, that businesses and, and individuals are facing. Okay, well, well, I'll let Leslie Charles come in because you want to answer your point, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, Leslie. I mean, I just wanted to say that in terms of thinking about, you know, whether underemployment is an, an automatic natural response, I mean, I think part of um, an aspect of dimension here is trying to, to use some of the um, important labour market in, um, information that we have already and look at underemployment um, alongside other information we have about um, employer practices and certainly through the UK Commission Employer Skills Survey we can get a good sense of um, the markets that businesses are operating in, um, how they respond to those businesses, what management practices they adopt and start to think through what implications that raises for skill, wider skills deficiencies as, as, as Pat has already alluded to but also then, you know, outcomes in terms of uh, effective skills utilisation and so on. And I think we need to get better at trying to understand that. I mean, certainly from some of the um, initial analysis we've done so far, and this is using a survey that w was just um, published um, at the latter part of um, last year, so there's still work to do. But, um, you know, certainly, you know, agree with them or emphasise the points Pat was say saying, that, you know, underemployment as measured by... Um, uh, proxies for skills do, certainly does seem to be to greater than other uh, indicators of mismatch and skill deficiency and there's certainly a strong correlation between um, the product markets that businesses are operating in and the skills profiles of their workforce so you tend not to have um, as much uh, overskilling and underutilisation, where you've got businesses that are in more complex product market areas and have higher higher skilled workforces, um, and and I think those sort of Im understanding those uh, Im it's an important dimension of it. There are also implications as well in terms of the skills investment approaches that employers are taking. Um, and, um, you know, mo stronger investment uh, patterns are associated, again, you know, as you would probably expect, but with high-skilled um, areas um, and uh, targeting work in particular at professional workers. So, you know, what we can see is that, say, taking, you know, headline levels um, of investment across Scotland, you might, might find that nearly three-quarters of businesses are investing in their staff in any one year. But you start to cut into the, the shape and nature and perhaps a effectiveness of some of that investment, you immediately see that it only reaches sort of half of the workforce, it only goes to skill, more skilled workers and so on. Um, and I think some of these stories are really important for us to understand um, by sector, by different types of um, businesses, by different uh, geographies and how, you know, uh, employers are working uh, singly and collectively through networks. These are all important dimensions, really, in terms of understanding what's going on. Um, and, and then perhaps, you know, coming up with strategies and action that, um, you know, can facilitate um, workers uh, and businesses um, working more effectively, ensuring their future investment is more effective in future, and that, um, you know, that, that there is a kind of um, better um, deployment and use of, of workers um, as well. Um, Paul Susan wanted to come in with a brief comment, and I'll come back to after Mike. Yeah, I mean, just... <clears throat> Just a quick point in terms of um, you know the kind of language and how we talk about these things because I think yeah there are a number of kind of distinct issues going on that are you know, underneath this umbrella term of underemployment. If you look at the UK as a whole, um, hours under employment is now about three million, but before the recession it was about two million. So there's clearly a longer term issue as well as a recession related issue, and a recession related issue is clearly linked to you know general demand in the economy. Um, the longer term issue, if you looked at the characteristics, if you look at the characteristics of those people who are in, um, who are underemployed, hours underemployed, um, you know, those characteristics are very similar to you know some of the wider issues around you know low paid, poor quality work, 
more generally. So I just I think you know as, as we talk about this, and then the, you know the skills underutilisation point. Um, again, there are significant overlaps, but it's a it's a slightly distinct um, distinct concept, and I think it's it's quite helpful to have in mind you know which which bits of these which policy <coughs> levers might address, um, and you know they're clearly not all the same thing. I think, I think we want to come on to that, talking about you know what can we actually do about it in due course. I'll come back to Mike first. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to really... Um, I mean, I think there's a danger for us as a committee that, um, as Stephen was saying, David Bell last week was, you know, not really sure if this was good or bad. And there's a danger that we actually... We see this as a, as a committee in our inquiry. We recognise this phenomena, but beyond that, we don't really learn much more. And I think um, everybody seems to be a wee bit tentative with regard to this issue, um, I just wonder, and it's it's not that I, I, I you know, uh, myself I'm uncertain, I'm not advocating a particular course or direction, but it seems to me that we're in a, we're in a, some commentators are suggesting <coughs> that we could be looking at a flatlining economy at best for perhaps a decade or more, um, and, you know, if perhaps we should maybe think a wee bit more radically about some of these problems. Well, let's just leave that issue hanging in there for yep. the moment, because there's other members who want to come in. I'll start. I'll start off with Dennis, and then and then we'll bring some others in. Go, going down a completely different line altogether. Uh, one of it um, is to do with the education uh, in terms of college universities, uh, and I'm taking Leslie's point about the um, work placements uh, and work experience. Um, is enough being done? And are you engaging enough, or is there is there enough engagement? with the, the colleges, universities and definitely the schools um, to ensure that what's coming out at the end, whether it be people with just a, a degree or just an appropriate skill, is there enough being done to, to meet the need in the market? I think, Patrick, I think that's one for you initially. Yeah. Uh, there was something I was going to say um, before I come on to, to, to Dennis's question, just to say one of the things we can do, I think, um, for employers is the, the skills and training system I think in, in, in any advanced country is inherently complex and it's dynamic so, so it continues to change so it's quite difficult for employers maybe to, to have a, a handle on how the system actually works and there's possibly two things you can do you can either try and simplify the system with the danger of oversimplification or you can do what we've done which is to build something like our skills force to say for, for employers if you want to recruit someone or you're looking at training an existing member of staff and you want to say, oh, what's the national offer and what's the local offer and how can I put these together? Then that's what our skills force does, is to try and help you cut through, employers to cut through the complexity. My particular in, uh, interest in that is to say that we have the UK Commission's uh, survey every two years, which is a large scale survey, gives us some really good evidence. But working with James and the SCDI and, and working with the Chambers of Commerce, we, we, we've produced a pulse survey every quarter to try and just keep a temperature test of what businesses are saying. In terms of school leavers and, and, and their understanding of the world of work, <coughs> and Dennis's question, a couple of things, I suppose. One is to say that, again, from, from the evidence, two-thirds of employers who recruit a school leaver think that that school leaver is well prepared for the world of work. So let's, let's be clear where we are. Where the, where the employer thinks the young person isn't well prepared, it's really around issues around maturity, a lack of understanding, that, or, or <coughs> that the, the young person has maybe a lack of understanding of the world of work. Is that gender specific? I'm not sure, actually. Just <laughs> and, and, and the other issue is, is around the employer's perception of the young person's attitude, personality and motivation, none of which are skills, I hasten to add. In terms of how do we encourage young people to get a better understanding of the world of work, that's why we have things like My World of Work, you know, part of a blended careers and information advice and guidance system that says, you know, face-to-face -face is available if you want it, there's a telephone, there's a website, and we're delivering it through partners. We need to make sure that young people's <coughs> individual aspirations are tempered by understanding of what the opportunities are that are out there. Yeah, I just wonder if anyone else wants to comment before. Yeah, um, 
James, do you want to come? Yeah, I'll, I'll come in. I think, a, I think it's a good question and something we've talked about uh, in, in this committee, in fact, in the past and, and elsewhere, is uh, um, what are commonly called soft skills, but uh, what, what we really believe should be regarded as far more important than just you know, soft skills, um, business skills, uh, skills for employment, skills for the economy, um, things like uh, Team working, presenting, sales, uh, uh, you know, these are absolutely vitally important skills and I think it links on to something Leslie said about uh, work experience because some of these skills can be gained through work experience and certainly these skills are gained through employment which is why underemployment is preferable to unemployment because it certainly allows an opportunity to gain some of these wider business uh, skills or skills to use in the workplace. Um, but also, I think there's opportunities with work experience programs or, um, or, or, or elsewhere through the assessment mechanisms in courses. Um, that, that the, I know that the work is being done on this and Skills Development Scotland and the colleges and universities are working on this, but I think there's, there's a lot more that can be done on this area of developing all the skills that employers need to ensure that once uh, someone that's left uh, school, college or university who comes into their workplace um, as an employee is able to immediately make a bottom line benefit to that organisation that they enter. Um, it's not, it's, it, it, at the moment certainly where the economy is, employers, particularly small employers, cannot afford to take somebody on if if you know, even you know, within the first twelve months, they're not making a bottom line benefit to to what that organisation's or what that company is trying to achieve. So that's why it's crucial that work experience and those soft skills are embedded in curriculums. Mm -hmm. um, one of the areas that, that particularly concerns me is that we seem to be having an acceptance, uh, an overall acceptance, that underemployment, um, the the vast majority are women. Um, now, there, there may be particular reasons for that, but I'm just wondering if you've got a comment on that. I mean, I, I actually find it quite disturbing that they seem to have an acceptance that, it's, that, that this is very sort of gender-specific. Probably Stephen, maybe. Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's entirely true, actually. Uh, I mean, I think if you look at the component of underemployed who are in part-time work, then that is overwhelmingly women. But it's also a very significant proportion now reporting underemployment whilst in nominally full-time occupations, and that is by a significant margin uh, male. Uh, so I don't think when we look at unemployment in the round, it's necessarily true to say that it affects women significantly worse than it does men. I think... The evidence to suggest that there's more women in the underemployment, um, uh, and, uh, and what concerned me was when the, the figures are presented, that there just seemed to be an acceptance about it. Well, I mean, again, I mean, I'm not sure my statistics necessarily tell that same story. I mean, I, I certainly don't think, certainly in the SDUC's part, and I think to be fair, the Scottish Government's also, I don't think there's uh, any acceptance that the various and very significant problems facing women in the labour market at this moment in time are being accepted. When we had the Women's Employment Summit uh, in September last year, there's been a range of activity flowed from that. There's now five working groups, and I think there's a lot of very serious activity in Scotland trying to make sure that the particular barriers facing women in the labour market are overcome. Um, yes, uh, Leslie, yes. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to come back on this um, general point in the sense that I think um, some of the debates about the differences between gender experiences of, of underemployment are often because um, there are certain statistics that are more widely known and in particular, underemployment as expressed in terms of you know, people wanting to work additional hours is a dimension of that, and that's certainly been very heavily debated and promoted. Um, I think, you know, perhaps historically, because you know, the, the labour market is a dynamic thing and it changes. And so in that sense, you're always going to have a certain degree of skills mismatch and underemployment as an element of that. And that's not necessarily bad. I think what's um, grabbing attention at the moment is it's, it's reaching certain levels and it's growing over time. And then, you know, you've got to sort of think about how, that, how, the, how the market's working and if that's an indicator of um, a more significant market failure. But um, I think a particular point that I wanted to emphasize emphasize is that we, you know, as, as my introductory comment suggested, underemployment, yes, there are general elements of it, but what's really important, and this is what I was really getting at in terms of
terms of different stories, is you have to be careful that a sort of general national picture does not um, then sort of lead to sort of blanket responses in terms of action. Because actually, you've got to unpick different dimensions of it. Because, you know, yes, historically, it might have affected more women because more women perhaps had caring responsibilities and they were therefore more likely to shift into sort of more flexible forms of employ employment. What is a character over time or a de um, development over time is it is something that is experienced, you know, men are experiencing as much as women because that's when actually there are different dimensions to the nature of that underemployment and some of that is associated with the recession is a kind of more de demand uh, driven cause in that, you know, businesses are experiencing difficulty and they're, they're taking this as a, an alternative approach in terms of their business strategy. So those are just illustrations of the sort of different dimensions of the issue and I think we've really got to dig into it and understand it uh, and that's important to say. The other thing in doing that and enhancing understanding, I do think we've got to draw attention to the other indicators that we have. We've talked about the, the Commission's Employee Skills Survey. That's an indicator coming from it, underemployment in terms of under, understanding it more from a skills perspective. But there are other measures as well. Um, and in particular, two I wanted to um, emphasise. One is um, the, well, it's had various titles, but um, I'm trying to remember what the latest one is, but Work Skills in Britain, Skills Survey, um, dimensions of that. That's an individual survey that's existed since 1986. And it's actually shown the last survey was 2006. The Commission has just supported the update of that and the results will be coming out in this spring. And what that's doing is actually asking individuals connected to the workplace to give their perception of, you know, um, and it's asked in such a way so that it's, it's not a kind of leading set of questions, but it's trying to objectively get at what are the qualification skill levels they have and what are the minimum requirements for the job. And what that has been showing over time is that, um, you know, skill surplus, skill um, overqualification, you know, is increasing as a dimension of, of the UK labour market. And that's another, I think, um, important information source to, to, to bring into this kind of debate. The second information source um, takes us right back to the beginning in terms of where we were in um, comparing the UK to, to the rest of Europe. And the OECD um, is running a survey, PIAC, which stands for, if I can remember it, the Programme of International Assessment of Adult Competencies. And that's a similar survey to, to, to the skills survey that I was mentioning, but actually involves other OECD member states. There are about 20 or so countries. And that's going to be coming out results later this year. And that's going to be quite important in terms of helping us set, again, the UK um, labour market in a much wider global picture and, and to really try and understand um, you know, what's going on here. Um, just before I quickly, while I've, I've hogged the floor, just before I shut up, I mean, on the dimension of work experience, um, the other thing to say in terms of um, one of our employer um, sources survey sources, um, we know that about a, a quarter of businesses actually offer, say that they offer some kind of work placement, work experience opportunity um, for young people. Um, and there's a question, you know, with, with, with all of these statistics, you then have to make a debate about whether that's good enough um, or not and what that actually kind of means. I mean, set that alongside wider labour market evidence. We do think that there's a certain degree of um, collapse in the labour market about the opportunities for young people more generally, um, and that um, you know, um, you know, we maybe want to kind of be looking or, or, or keeping a li an eye on this sort of um, area of uh, practice. Um, and one dimension to that is that I think it's important that we promote this <laughs> in the context of you know growing um, uh, youth unemployment. Um, you know, it's important that employers you know um, have uh, good objective information, drawing attention to some of these things. So, in that sense, one of the mentions that we've been doing is, 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 is to try and um, uh, incentivise a wider kind of call to action and, and, and to promote the, the kind of existence of the issue. So that that's sort of one dimension for employers to think about their, their future practices moving forward. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got various members who want to come in. I'll maybe take a couple of points and then we'll, we'll, we'll go back to discussion. So Rhoda and then check. So Rhoda first. Hi. <laughs> maybe change the subject slightly and yes, look at it from a, an, another angle. I suppose it's the impact of underemployment. Um, I think on the face of it, 
you kind of compare underemployment and unemployment and say, well, underemployment has to be better. But then when we look at some of the evidence, there's de-skilling, people not using their skills properly, ending up in jobs where maybe they are then being paid less for those skills. So, so there's that impact and there's also the impact of poverty and, you know, because you're not bringing home the same salary um, and all that continuing while you're in work. So are the, I suppose, impacts on the person of underemployment any better um, in, in the long term than the impacts of unemployment? And given that this seems to be, um, I suppose, carrying on the situation even longer, um, is, is that impact going to be as bad? You know, it seems, is, is this a better thing or is it not? Let's hold that thought for a second and I'll, I'll bring in check. Yes, I want to, uh, just a comment that, that Leslie made. A, a, underemployment is, is unacceptable. We, we, you talked about a UK labour market and then you talked about youth unemployment. Well, it, <coughs> some people may not like it, but Scotland is different from the rest of the UK now. We, for example, have a youth unemployment minister who has, a, 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 across, the, across the parliament, helped to create programmes that you're alluding to that we should do, and in fact we're already doing it. Um, the, the, the problem in terms of Scotland being different is, is the, the looking at the macroeconomic, uh, 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 the approach to, to macroeconomics in terms of how we stimulate demand. Um, and it was interesting that uh, Patrick mentioned that demand for labour in the Scottish economy is uh, is depressed. And I, I tend to go to the other end of the spectrum. I mean, we're short of 60,000 engineers. We're increasing our exports over the next four years. We're uh, doing various other things that we'd like to do in terms of capital investment, which even with leakage would generate the kind of demand in the economy, but we can't do that. So, and I think there's also a cultural shift. And the question I'd like to ask is, uh, we're seeing a fairly dramatic shift towards social enterprises uh, and self-employment in Scotland, um, and, and I believe more than in the rest of the UK. And I just wonder why uh, you know, that, that is, and if you have any you know, views in terms of the macroeconomic challenges facing us. Okay, um, well, a couple of disparate points. One, one, one Rhoda's point was about whether underemployment is a good or bad thing compared to unemployment because of the impact it has on individuals. And Chick's point is about macroeconomic challenges and also maybe the specific point about um, uh, mismatches in the in the labour market. Maybe start off with, with, with Patrick. Self-employed. And self-employed. Patrick, you'll start. Um, just to pick up the, the specific point about engineering, as, as I did say, there are skill shortages in Scotland, you know, in particular areas and particular sectors. And I suppose that's why uh, in SDS we would be familiar with their uh, sector skills investment plans, which is the idea is, is to engage with business, gather the evidence and say, what are your what are your plans for growth? What's the role of skills and training within that? How do we make sure that the system in Scotland is, is coordinated to make sure that it provides what the sectors need? Um, I'll duck out the question on uh, microeconomics. Uh, I, think, I don't think that sits well with the skills agency. <coughs> energy Skills Academy is probably one example of that. Absolutely, from the first uh, energy skills investment plan. So I think there are things that SDS can contribute to and it can help coordinate activity. I think um, you know the Scottish and English systems are different, particularly around skills, and we'll be publishing something later on this year, particularly around our apprenticeship programme, mm. uh, in terms of published a survey earlier on in two, early in 2012 when we asked modern apprentices what they thought of the programme. The results were generally positive. We know there's been a big discussion about what happens to these apprentices when they leave the programme, and we'll be publishing something later on this month. James? Um, yeah, thanks, Camina. Um In terms of Rhoda's question on uh, underemployment, is it worse or better than unemployment? I think uh, one, of, one of the... Uh, well-held mantras around uh, getting a job, the best way to get a job is to have a job already um, and I think that goes back to my point I made earlier around the best way to develop the skills that you need in the workplace um, in terms of the, the, the soft of the business skills um, is, is to be in the workplace building those skills to, 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 to get that experience. Now what, what, we, what we're hoping for and what we have said in our submission is that if people are uh, underemployed, particularly in part-time employment, that um, our education sector should respond flexibly to um, 
to that um, scenario and allow people that have a bit of time to spare, that have said they would like to do more hours but aren't currently doing them, to use that spare time to gain new skills, to develop new qualifications, to um, uh, which, which will allow them to potentially on the next job get a better job than they would have been able to given the skills that they had um, at present. Um, and certainly that uh, is, is one way that we think um, the education sector can respond. Certain, and another way, um, and this is something that has always been a strength of our education sector, and this was sort of picked up the macroeconomic challenges, is colleges and universities always look around them, particularly the college sector is very good at this, um, at the skills that are required by local employers and by other organisations across uh, the country um, and are very quick and able to respond quickly to the needs of employers in terms of the skills sector and I think that's something that's, that's very positive uh, and we want to see and we're, we're working with Skills Development Scotland and others to promote the links between employers and the education sector um, uh, to try and ensure that 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 offering from colleges and universities matches as closely as possible um, what it is that employers need. Um, and finally, I just want, I didn't have a chance to, to pick up the gender issues that, that, uh, that Dennis raised, but uh, um, I think that, that there is an important dimension around gender to this. Um, it, it, Professor Bell's submission, written submission, refers to men being a, a, a key uh, challenge in terms of underemployment. In his uh, evidence to the committee, he also talked about challenges women face, and I think there are some really uh, significant gender issues around underemployment, and I don't think we really know the answer to what they are, and I think that that would be an area where the committee could perhaps um, commission or ask for some further research or where further research is definitely required. Can I say, I'm kind of surprised that James hasn't addressed the self-employment issue in terms of, you know, given you know, where you're employed. I mean, what is... Why is this, this, do you think, uh, I have my own views, but uh, this change to self-employment and the cultural shift in terms of people employing themselves or uh, small businesses wishing to take on more people but because of the, the kind of economic circumstances can't do it? Um. I, I suppose I think uh, self-employment has always been a factor of this economy and many others. Uh, it, it perhaps is increasing at the moment. I think people have... Um, seen opportunities to perhaps become uh, self-employed. People that maybe previously regarded themselves as overemployed or working more hours than they wanted to do have seen it as an opportunity to, to reduce their hours. There, in, in, many, in many levels, there are a huge number of skills and people that have uh, retired or want to take early retirement and uh, becoming self-employed is a way that they've been able to continue to use their skills whilst working fewer hours. Um, th there's a, a huge raft of reasons around self-employment, and uh, I'm not claiming to have all the answers around that, I'm afraid. Um, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, trying to answer Rhoda's question, I think we'll go back to Mr McKenzie's question of earlier on as well. I mean, you know, asking if we were all prevaricating here about whether or not this is a good or bad thing. I mean, I'm happy to report that we think this is an unambiguously bad thing, that there is 240,000 people in Scotland unable to work the hours that they want to work. That is not a good thing. Now, you can't then draw from that that every response to underemployment that's been implemented since the recession is wrong. You know, I mean, I think for the position of workers, Alexander Dennis, who came to that negotiated settlement, that works for both workers and management. But for the economy as a whole, if we are under under utilising what we're told by politicians of all stripes on a regular basis is our greatest resource, and that is our people, then that is a problem for the economy Steve, as a whole. I interrupt you there, because part of the evidence we heard from David Bell last week was the fact that if the alternative to underemployment is unemployment, as in other European countries, is it better to have people who are partially employed, which I think is the point that uh, uh, James was making, or for them to be unemployed? Just coming on to that in terms of Rhoda's question about the effects of the individual. I mean, if push comes to shove, then I think we would probably all argue that in most cases it's better that someone is employed rather than unemployed. I mean, I think the real problem is that although the research that tells us why unemployment is such a bad thing for individuals is very well understood, there's a massive body of evidence and it continues to accumulate, there is now an accumulating body of evidence that tells us how bad bad jobs are for individuals as well. I've been stuck in the rut of uh, bad employment, low wage, insecure employment, or it's very often the case moving quite quickly between bad jobs and unemployment, back into bad jobs, unemployment. Again, these lead to very similar kind of effects that individual that periods of long-term unemployment have in terms of skill erosion, in terms of uh, health, future uh, life prospects. Etc. I mean, very, very similar. And we need to bear in mind that you know the UK. I mean, I don't have Scottish specific figures for this, but in terms of low wage and secure employment, the UK is 
more such jobs than any other developed country apart from the United States. I mean, it's a major problem here, and it goes back to the point that Paul made earlier on with two million people underemployed before the recession hit. You know, I mean, this is a very long-standing problem, and it, you know, it, it really reflects the fact that we're probably all much too complacent before the recession hit. You know, looking at headline statistics and thinking the labour market was much tighter than it actually was. You know, there's been much more slack in there. Uh, for a, a longer period, I think, than most of us recognise. In terms of self-employment, I mean, now our uh, submission, I think, is quite clear, drawn in evidence from the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development and others, that the rise in self-employment through the recession is something that we should all be worried about and is certainly a component of the wider debate about underemployment. I mean, the evidence suggests that people are not making an enthusiastic choice to start working for themselves. I mean, they're trying to scratch a living doing what they previously did as employed individuals. They tend to be earning less, they tend to be working less hours, they're paying less tax. You know, if you think of our current economic situation, it's not good that we're finding more people earning less and paying less tax. And I think when we look at you know, the headline numbers are people moving into self-employment and trying to pretend that this is reflective of a sort of entrepreneurial uh, boom in Scotland. I think, you know, we're just kidding ourselves. I mean, it's a sign at this moment in time, it's a sign of economic weakness rather than strength. Um, yeah, Alison, you've got to say it. Yeah, yeah I'd just maybe like to ask the witnesses if, if you have any views on whether or not this is a cultural shift that may become embedded and irreversible to any extent. You know, is it likely that when things start to pick up, people might think, you know, employers may think, oh, I'd prefer to have two part-time employees than one full-time. So maybe a bit of discussion around advantages and disadvantages there, um, both for the employee and the employer. Um, I'm interested in the, the self-employment question too, because you would think there would be some benefits to a broadening of the type of people that might previously never have considered it. And if then we need to be looking at greater support, taking on board your, your queries, retaxation and so on. So it's whether that support is in place and if we have any evidence about whether self-employment is more likely to fail in the current economic um, position we find ourselves in, I, I would imagine it would be very difficult, but, but do we have any figures? And just a couple of more a couple of more points. Obviously, there are some women at the moment who are, who've just taken a step out of the out of the employment market because of childcare, and this is before we even approach the current situation. Because, you know, if you if you find out you're going to be thirty pounds better off at the end of the week, then clearly, I think there's a there's a massive impact on women. Um, that I would I would support your view that we should call for more research on the impacts, and just about the quality of jobs too and the need perhaps to to link grant support to what kind of jobs we're actually offering people you know if it's just about you know if they're very simple unskilled tasks that may be here for a while and then disappear do we really need to have a look at that um on a national level and just one final concern about the quality of the statistics there's a there's a couple of you know pieces in the evidence suggesting that we need more regular and up-to-date information and that sometimes there's a lag between the information we have at UK level and it reaching us here in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, Paul, do you want to come in on this? I mean, a whole range of points there from Alison, but, but, but <laughs> don't apologise. But, but, but maybe, you know, the issue is, you know, are we seeing a culture change, do you think? So even if, if and when, you know, we, we, we see economic growth back, will, will, will patterns of employment have changed? And secondly, this issue of self-employment rising? Yeah. I mean, in terms of the culture change, I think, I mean, the short answer is it's probably too early to say anything, you know, very useful or interesting about that. I mean, I think if you look at the UK more generally, and David Bell's paper actually suggested this wasn't the case in Scotland, um, but underemployment started going up from the middle of the 2000s, you know, albeit relatively slowly, you know, which suggests that there might be some, you know, kind of longer-term shifts um, around this, but I mean, I wouldn't want to, you know, place too much, too much emphasis on that. Um, just going back to the self-employment point, I mean, I think, you know, we don't fully understand it. We don't fully understand what's going on around self-employment yet, just because of lags in the data and the, the time it takes people to analyse the, the more detailed statistics around it. But I think, um, I mean, Stephen's point is right in that the the, the information that we have at the moment um, actually suggests that self-employment is a um, often born of necessity rather than choice um, and often the self-employment self-employed jobs that are being created tend to be relatively low hours um, and relatively low earnings so I think I mean we need to be a, a little bit careful about how we kind of um, 
interpret interpret that in, in terms of whether it's a you know a strength or a weakness. I think in terms of overall, overall um, issues around job quality, so I mean the Work Foundation is all, is all you know all the research bases around you know issues of job quality, improving job quality, and I think there is a um, there is a wider issue around job quality and low wage work you know right across the UK, and there are a number of things that you can do to address that, and you know things like you know. Um, I should just suggest tying grant support into you know a certain threshold of job quality, whether it be wages or opportunities for progression, um, is probably a good thing. Um, just two more, two more quick points, if that's okay. Um, on the impact side of it, and whether underemployment or unemployment um, are preferable. I mean, I think if you you know you generally take the view that underemployment is sort of marginally preferable to unemployment, um, but actually the, the, it might look quite different for young people than it does for adults. And that's for a number of reasons. So for young people, what we know is that actually experience of the workplace is often a key barrier to getting into employment um, and to moving forward. So some experience of the workplace is, you know, is useful for young people, whether it's on part-time um, or full-time hours. You know, for adults, that might look slightly different. Um, firstly, because they're more likely to be supporting families. So you know, household income is really quite important under those circumstances. And if you look at what's happened to real wages, so hours have gone down, but actually wages per hour have gone down as well. So it's a kind of double whammy. Um, so there are, you know, there are, there are real and genuine impacts on household finances um, associated with that. I think the other point, and it's one that, that Stephen made as well, is if you look at um, if you look at the longer term effects of entering low wage or poor quality employment for adults. Um, there's some research that suggests the wage scar associated with that. So it's the impact on longer term earnings um, of entering, you know, low wage work is actually not that dissimilar to those experienced by people who are unemployed. So I think the the, the longer term trade off is, you know, is not is not um, is not quite clear cut. Just a quick point on the data issue. So, um, you know, clearly, regular um, labour market information is important. I think it's also, in terms of how you interpret interpret that, there's quite a lot of sampling error associated with some of the you know, labour force survey statistics when you get down to country level and you break it down by um, small population groups. So it's not just about having the the data, but I think it's also about um, how robust it is and, and how you interpret it. So Thank not, you. so that's good. Thank you, Paul. And we just want to pick up on Alison's point, Stephen. I bet you come back in Alison's yeah. point. I mean, the, the one about the cultural shift. I mean, I guess it, you know I agree with Paul that it's too early to say what's happening post recession. I guess my bigger concern would be, you know, are we embedding some of the shifts that we were already beginning to see happening before the recession? I mean, regarding the casualisation of working you know, with a shift from what were previously, you know, permanent, uh, well-paid, secure jobs to less, uh, you know, less quality jobs. You know, you look at the CIPD's work about self-employment, and they highlight the fact that the self-employment we've seen since the start of the recession is very much uh, uh, concentrated in sectors where we don't have a history of self-employment really and they list education, FT, uh, IT, finance, etc. You know, so I mean, our, you know, our concern there, and we said it certainly hear it from colleagues in the finance sector, is you know, the, the, the continued shift towards less secure, less well-paid employment in that sector is really quite remarkable and worrying. You know, you also think other sectors in Scotland have tended to provide, you know, really good quality employment. You know, you think things like journalism may not have much sympathy around this table, I'm not sure, but, you know, I mean, it used to be a decent employer in Scotland, good quality jobs, very, very casualised now. Teaching, you know, I mean, again, continually shifting towards casualisation. And you're even seeing it in transport, uh, sections of transport now as well, you know, shift towards zero hour contracts, etc. And I think it's kind of a shame, I think, that we don't actually know. I think if we're all agreed, this is primarily a demand side problem. It would have been interesting in Scottish Enterprise, maybe, were around the, the table today, and they'd maybe have been able to give a comment on what it might mean in terms of incentives for firms if you were going to try and tie in job quality to any incentives offered to, with regard to um, FDI in Scotland. Um, but I think, just very quickly, a couple of other things you mentioned. Quality of... Statistics. I think we've said a couple of things in our, um, our submission to the committee. I mean, I think they'd like to, you know, put on record that the Scottish government, who's really led the field here, and Roshan was given evidence to you before, but the work they have done through the local area labour markets report has not been published anywhere else in the UK, and it's very much to be welcomed. We've seen the ONS now publish one detailed report on underemployment. What we want to see now is this work being built on to provide something that's much more regular, much more up to date, and then we can all maybe start having a, a better. Form discussion. 
Uh, regarding, I mean, you talk about women leaving the labour force. The last set of employment statistics published on the 12th of December were really quite remarkable for Scotland. We've seen a big fall in unemployment in 19,000 over the quarter, an even bigger fall in employment and a huge rise in economic inactivity, which was very much concentrated on women. Now, but, you know, it would be dangerous to read too much into one month's statistics like that, but if that is a trend that we're going to see continuing to that degree, women leaving the labour force altogether, then we're all going to have to be very careful what we're saying about falling unemployment, because if it's really just women leaving the labour force, that's not, not a good thing. We're going to bring in Margaret McDougall, who's been very patient so far. Thank you. Um, I mean, we've heard quite a bit about the programmes that are available uh, to try and get people into work and try and it organise the, the skills mismatch. So what more can government do to support jobs by providing more programmes and um, perhaps there's early evidence suggesting that direct support to employers is working. For example, the mechanism that they're using in Germany has uh, is proven to be successful. I just wondered what uh, the panel had to say about that. Patrick? In terms of those kind of mechanisms, I think uh, I mean, that's a policy decision for, for the Scottish Government. I, I would pick up um, on that point to say, you know, one of the things we need to think about, and, and it's really important, particularly when we engage with young people, there, there may very well be a gender issue to underemployment, which was picked up. And you know, the European Commission, I think their measure is they ask part-time workers, would you like to work more hours? And that's predominantly, or, or certainly there are more female part-time workers. The work, one of the surveys that Leslie mentioned, um, we have Alan Felstead, we have something we do with the Skills Committee called Skills in Focus, where experts come up and, and talk to invited audience, and then we publish the papers on our website. Uh, Paul is doing one on Friday on low-wage workers, and Alan Felstead actually did pick up this issue about the, the issue of underemployment for young people. This cycle between periods of, of, of no work and low-paid, low-skilled work, picking up Stephen's point about the effect that might have on their long-term careers. And, and again, picking up uh, Chick's point, I mean, that's why we've got a Youth Employment Minister in Scotland. For young people, I suppose, in it, rather than, than, than a skills agency trying to talk about stimulating demand, one of the things we, we should be looking at is, what do we mean by a good job? And actually what we know is that in the round, that job quality, the top five characteristics, only one of them is extrinsic, which is, uh, sorry, is, is job security. The others are using your initiative, work you like doing, the opportunity to, to use your abilities and friendly people to work with. Now, those things vary by hours worked, they vary by gender, and they vary by your position in the occupational hierarchy. What we will find out in the summer from this survey is, do they vary by position in the economic cycle? But, but for people, it's to think, you know, what makes a good job? It relates to your individual aspirations. There aren't sets of good jobs and, and necessarily bad jobs. It's, it's self-strength horizons networks. And that's what we need to encourage young people to think about. What are you interested in? What are you good at? What jobs are out there? How do you, how do you make yourself suitable for those employers? Okay, can I maybe ask a couple of questions just to throw into the mix? Because I'm conscious we've been running for, for, for more than an hour. Um, two things we haven't touched on yet. Um, first of all, the question of productivity, which came out of the discussion we had with um, David Bell last week. Um, I mean, it goes without saying that, that you know, if the alternative was to un unemployment was full employment, that would be much more productive. But are people working shorter hours than they would like? In, in, are they in themselves unproductive? Because there's a bit of evidence suggests that actually it can be more productive having part-time workers than full-time workers. So I'm interested if anyone's got any perspectives on, on the issue of productivity. And the second point is, um, if we if we believe that underemployment is is a bad thing, what what can we do about it? I mean, obviously, I mean, it's obvi you know it goes without saying that you know the the, the, the long term and, and fundamental solution to this is greater demand within the economy. But what, short of that, what policy changes, if any, might help? I'll pick that up. Yes, Leslie. I mean, just to have an initial uh, reaction to an aspect of that in terms of, you know, whether this is um, a good or bad thing in terms of, you know, um, the impact of it and whether it affects productivity and performance. And I think one dimension of this is that um, 
the drive, as I said um, earlier, the drivers to it are, are, are many and various, and there are clearly aspects to it that are not good around some of the things that, that Stephen's alluded to in terms of the casualisation of work and lack of quality work, and then often associated with that if you're not um, making full um, use of, uh, effectively, of, of the skills of workers. That is going to have an impact in terms of performance. But I think there is an aspect, the nature, of the future nature of work that we do need to take into account. And that will, and this is a challenge globally, um, you know, that we are, and we're already seeing this, aren't we, in terms of the character of the labour market and the growth of small businesses and how much they dominate the scene. And yes, most employment is still in the large businesses, but I think it was something when I was looking at the statistics for coming here today, it's something about 60% of businesses have one to four employers, employees in Scotland and only 5% uh, above 50 um, employees and so on of, in terms of establishments. Um, and um, that's going to, as I say, become a growing character of future. And in that sense, people will be making a business choice. We'll be having you know, micro freelancers and micro entrepreneurs and micro professionals. And if you get into any kind of debate about the future, it's really challenging business practices, even in terms of where we are now, about their management models and how they're adapting to that and whether the traditional full-time employee um, and and how you know the management practices you use to manage those employees, whether that you know that's not going to become the sort of dominant model, and clearly in that kind of dimension, just coming at it from a kind of futures orientation, um, that's just another sort of dimension to sort of throw into the thinking here, I think, and so that draws me back to this point about not just generally thinking that underemployment is a bad thing and there are different dimensions of it, there is different character to it, there are different causes to it and we do have to develop these kind of stories and understand that um, and, and that's an important dimension of it really. Um, any thoughts on any policy changes that might assist? For me, hmm. sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Les. I conveniently you were on the spot, though, I would just ask you. <laughs> um, in terms of policy changes, okay. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, clearly coming from the point of the UK uh, Commission, I'd give our kind of perspective of this and a, a key dimension since we're all in agreement that, you know, demand, there is a demand question here that's quite important. And, and from our perspective, we're trying to, you know, working through our commissioners who are leading players from, from business and so on, um, we're trying to get employers to own the agenda and, and to lead on some of those um, dimensions. In, and in, in that sense, we're running a Degree, a, a number of um, investment or challenge funds to uh, get employees to come forward for, with propositions about how they might do things differently or, you know, and in that sense you're thinking about the operation of the skills system in its widest sense. You're not just thinking, you know, yes, the Commission has been kind of set up as a social partnership to work with government and to influence and shape the publicly funded system and, and policy environment, but we're also kind of working to ensure that show that, that works effectively with private investment and in that sense we're trying to I guess secure greater employer engagement so part of the answer to that is that um, we get employers to step up to provide um, strategies for the long term about what they're seeking to do the challenges they're facing the barriers they're facing really trying to understand that and strengthen collaboration I think collaboration is a really key dimension of this collaboration with government collaboration through business networks collab collaboration through local communities with other local um, supplies providers who can help uh, employers um, effectively would deliver that because some of our um, em employer survey evidence suggests that employees are not, for a variety of different reasons, are not necessarily making use um, in large numbers of publicly funded skills and employment services. And there's a question, they're often going to the commercial sector. Now, it's not totally clear-cut but some, because sometimes programmes are delivered by commercial bodies, but I think there's an important dimension there, really, in terms of right, really trying to strengthen those um, collaborations. And in that sense, I mean, it, it comes out clearly to the kind of broader policy context you're operating in, but from looking to other countries and learning best practice from there, there's clearly things that government can do as a regulator, 
in terms of um, you know supplying services, in terms of buying services. There are other potential sort of policy levers that can be kind of nuanced to support um, some of, some of that new action and the new approaches that you're trialling with employers. So that that would be perhaps how I kickstart the discussion. That's helpful. Um, Paul, do you want to say anything about productivity or policy? Um. I mean, just on the on the policy point. I mean, I think you know there are a number of things you can do. I mean, ultimately, I think um, you know demand is is pretty fundamental in all this. Um, in particular, you know, um, UK wide, the additional one million people you've got who are underemployed. I mean, it seems pretty clear that's a function of demand. I, mean, I think in the longer term, there are a number of things you, you you can look at doing. I think one of the things you can look at doing is ways you can develop career ladders or structured progression routes either within sectors or within particular employers um, if you look at the kind of erosion of internal labor markets which stops people from you know kind of moving up the wage distribution um, are there policy levers you can use there um, to kind of negate some of that and to allow people to progress one of the things we, we don't know probably enough about um, with regards to underemployment and particularly the bit um, since the recession is you know we have figures on the stock of people who are underemployed we much we know much less about the dynamics within that so how long people are underemployed whether they tend to be moving on to other things um, so how much of it's temporary and how much of it seems to be permanent um, and that's quite important I think if you think about policy um, and the other area which is um, which draws on the, the, some of the things that Leslie was talking about is really around you know how employers employ demand for skills and use of skills um, and you know, I think there's all sorts of thing, all sorts of things you can do around that agenda. And you know, UKCS are kind of, I suppose, you know, leading on some of that. Okay. Okay. Um, Stephen. Yeah, uh, no productivity first of all. I know I see you did have a discussion with David. I seen you tried to dodge that one as well. You know, so <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think you know, I mean, engaging with all the very complex arguments around about the trajectory of productivity at UK level during this recession is really difficult, I think, within the time we're allowed to do. I mean, hugely complex issues. Just on a wider point about productivity, and, you know, given that so much of our discussion today has been based around about skills issues, it's really important, I think, to, you know, to get it on record that um, less than 20% of the UK's perceived productivity deficit with our major competitors, the US, Germany and France, is attributable to skills. I mean, the vast, vast bulk is down to the dearth of investment in capital equipment, R&D and infrastructure. You know, so we, we really need to be clear about that. Much of UK and Scottish industry is based in low innovation, low wage, low productivity sectors and very often the answer to competitive pressures within these sectors is to intensify work you know so that might why might be why some firms employing on a part-time basis become normally more productive whether or not that is fair on the workforce and whether or not it's sustainable as a business strategy in the longer term i think are the key issues regarding the longer term um, we'll Short-term policy issues, I mean, you would expect me to say, uh, you know, we need a significant boost to demand at this moment in time for the reasons I think that Paul outlined. Longer-term issues, I would agree with much of what Leslie and Paul have said. I mean, I think just in very broad terms at Scottish level, it would help if work and the quality of work became much more central to economic development discussion in Scotland. I don't think it really has been until now. I remember one of my first things I did in a job when I went to the SDUC was to attend the launch of the Framework for Economic Development in Scotland in 2000. And four, which is a very lengthy document all about how Scotland could improve its productivity and there was not a single mention in the document about those who were meant to become more productive, about how they were managed, about how they were engaged in the workforce you know, I mean, it was a really appalling document. I think we have made progress since the skills utilisation agenda which has been mentioned a number of times uh, was very positive I think but we also have to recognise that it didn't really go anywhere and quite where that sits at this moment in time I'm not sure. I mean we were very very heavily engaged in the early days of that through the leadership group through the cross-sectoral network, but I couldn't really point to any significant policy measure that emanated from that, so I think that's maybe something we could revisit as a, a matter of urgency. Thank you. Um, Patrick, it's probably not fair to ask you about policy changes. Do you want to say something about productivity? Yes, uh, completely unfair to ask me about productivity <laughs> changes. Uh, thank you very much for not asking me. Um, just to agree with uh, Stephen's point, I suppose, you know, the drivers of productivity competition, innovation, entrepreneurship, capital investment and skills. So if skills makes up 20% of the gap, what makes up the other 80%? So you know, it's really important, skills are really important, but so, as I said, are a whole host of other things. If we think about why productivity is important, then if we increase productivity in terms of output per hour worked, 
then we become a richer country and we can think about how we, how we distribute that wealth. But it's really about getting more people into work, making sure that they work the hours that they want and making sure those hours are as productive as possible. And that's a really big challenge and it's not a Scottish specific challenge, I don't think. Um, just to echo what's been said, I think the government has uh, a lot of control over all the different levers that are required to, to grow the economy, um, and, uh, and and I think I'm not I'm not going there. I think um, government included. I think all all levers should be used to best effect to create maximum growth in the economy. It's a very diplomatic response, right? Okay, Dennis. Yeah. Very quickly. Uh, uh, I suppose it's really related to the productivity aspect. But James, you made a comment earlier about people being underemployed and taking the opportunity to perhaps uh, upskill themselves by going to college, etc. Would you also agree that employers have a responsibility then to um, uh, maybe second people? to those courses, rather than expecting the individual employee then to go out and seek upskilling? I think that's a good question and uh, certainly the work we've done with employers uh, across Scotland, um, and that was actually specifically in relation to youth unemployment, but, uh, um, uh, but underemployment I think is, 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 would be similar, it demonstrates that employers are very keen to build the skills of their workforce, very committed to that, um, and I think that, that employers would welcome the opportunity to, to do more to engage with the, the college the and university sector. Um, well, I, th I think a lot of the courses that college and universities run, it's not about who pays for it, it's no. about the time, it's about um, uh, promotion of that, and I suppose... Um, uh, I, th I think employers um, working actually with Skills Development Scotland and the Our Skills Force website, which is a really uh, key resource in this. I suppose the question is, would they pay the employee to take up those opportunities? I, th I think well, what we're seeing is if, is if somebody is employed on a part-time basis, I think the challenge is that that's probably because the employer can't afford to have them on a full-time basis. And so what we need is for the publicly funded education sector to be working with those employers and for the employers to work with them. As I recognise it's a two-way street. Um, and to make sure that, that if that person who is employed part-time that they can use that remaining part of their time to, to, to do training and to ensure that, that the employer allows time for that to happen and the, the time that the, the person is working fits into um, how the college sector might operate and indeed that the college sector can f work flexibly to, to meet the needs of employers and I think if we can, you know, employers want to work with the education sector, they want to work with skills development and so on and are doing so um, and I think um, the more we can build on that the, the more effective we can be in that skills and productivity side of things. Just a, 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 to be fair and to be balanced, I suppose maybe with Stephen. Yeah, Stephen was keen to come in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to, because the question had been asked earlier on about Germany, and if you look at Germany's response in the early stages of the recession, it's all about managing underemployment and making sure that periods of downtime can be used to upskill. And we've seen how tremendously successful that's been for them through their period of upturn. There was also an interesting programme, I'm not quite sure where the evaluation has reached, but Wales in the early stage of the recession implemented a very kind of German type model called ProAct. And the, I think the steel and engineering sectors in Wales have been particularly badly hit. But again, it was about subsidising employers to retain staff, but to retrain them during the periods of downtime. And again, this is, you know, you know, we had discussions with the Scottish Government about this in Scotland, I mean, understandably they're concerned about what seems to be the high rates of deadweight ramped up in such programmes. But what we were arguing at the time, and I think what's been borne out since, is that, you know, that has to be balanced against the very, very positive longer term impact. So you might have to accept quite high deadweight because this stuff works, you know, and it makes sure you're very well positioned when the economy recovers. Okay, I think we had a very good discussion this morning, and I think we probably it, we need to draw it to a close. But um, can I, on behalf of committee members, say, uh, Enormous thank you to uh, our panellists who have come in to help with our discussion. Um, it's one of these areas where the more uh, we dig into it and the more uh, uh, contributions we hear, the more questions it raises in our minds. And uh, I'll be interested myself to see what conclusions we come to in due course. So uh, thank you all for coming. At that point, I think we'll have a short uh, suspension.
Right, if we can uh, reconvene, please. Um, we are at item number three on the agenda on the EU uh, work programme. Uh, Chick Brody is our uh, European uh, reporter, and we have a paper here from Chick uh, with some recommendations. Um, Chick, do you want to say anything about this? Very briefly. Firstly, can I uh, thank Jane for being uh, a supporter of both of the a meeting in, in Brussels. She lost my briefcase, but that's another story. Um, I heard it was your fault. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't, actually, but anyway. Um, it, it, she um, guided me happily through the meetings that we had. Uh, the paper in front of you shows, it really covers two things. One is the work programme uh, in terms of what we have to submit to the uh, European External Relations Committee. Um, I mean, the, 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 the recommendations are fairly uh, easy and simple to read. And Appendix A to the report indicates um, each of the, I think it's six, seven areas, eight areas, big one, uh, two of which really require some real monitoring. The rest are uh, simply uh, highlighting the fact that we, we keep a watching brief for things like the growth survey. Um, Long-term finance, I won't go through all of them. The key ones that we have to, uh, I would suggest we need to keep an eye on are, are the issues of energy policy and in terms of the, um, the funding of the uh, European Economic Government. So uh, I don't know if there are any questions on that particular element. Um, as I said, it's fairly uh, uh, simple. The most substantive uh, part of the report really is the is, as I mentioned, the, the, the meeting that we had in, in, uh, with two directorates in Europe, one with the Small Businesses uh, Directorate and the other with the Energy. Um, and again, I won't go through all of this. There are some fairly major highlights, particularly in discussions with the Small Business Directorate and the uh, people responsible or the person responsible for access to finance. Um, as we all know, that. The Commission deals directly with Member States, uh, which at this moment in time, of, of which Scotland is not one. Um, but there are issues, and Jane will keep me right, that were raised, um, not issues, but uh, uh, items which might require further action. And I would uh, ask the Committee's indulgence to allow us to continue uh, with some further correspondence with uh, the Directorate, particularly on the SME side before we make any uh, public pronouncements. Uh, the interesting part with the SME was that uh, there is, believe it or not, a small business envoy that each member state has. In our case, it's the Director of Enterprise for, for Biz, Business Innovation Skills uh, in Westminster. Um, we have suggested that it might be worthwhile on the basis that we have 350,000 small businesses that Scotland has its own small business envoy, and that will be a matter of discussion with, with Biz. The second a fairly significant element is that Enterprise Europe Network uh, has, what it has SME panels, which um, are used to allow SMEs to uh, be consulted on uh, policies and uh, future legislation. Uh, and again, because of the so I say, 350,000 SMEs that we have in Scotland, we thought it might be benefit that uh, they hold one of the panel meetings uh, you know, in the near future in Scotland. The last, the third item, which is fairly of, of significance from the SME uh, discussion, was the access to finance. It transpired uh, that uh, there are for the current seven-year period, Europe has 1.2 billion euros available through the SME Funding and Guarantee Programme uh, to cover the SMEs across Europe, which is very significant. Uh, it's particularly significant when it appears that, uh, and I have talked to uh, a few of the banks, that uh, we appear to have no, we have big bank, we have one intermediary. You're required to have an intermediary who can disburse these uh, funds, which generally tends to be venture capitalists or or the banks. Uh, having talked to some of the banks, they have their own programme, supported by the Westminster government. Uh, only one bank that I've talked to so far uh, was aware of this particular uh, uh, programme. So again, 
with your indulgence, I think we need to have further discussions uh, with regard to, to that before we make any a huge pronouncement. Um, the renewables report, I think, is fairly uh, comprehensive uh, and, and was extremely interesting in terms of what's happening uh, across Europe, particularly with uh, connectivity uh, of the grid across you know, or between countries like France and Spain. Uh, discussion on the use of biomass and, and there will be a proposal uh, on its use to be published soon. Um, so, but generally, as I say, I think the report is, and again, thanks to Jane, is fairly comprehensive. I mean, I'll take any questions that might be a bit, uh, interesting, a lot to be discussed, and um, if I may say so, it can be a, a, a requirement for more interaction uh, between uh, us and the European External Relations Committee and, and us and the European areas that we, we've suggested in the work programme, i.e. SME business and energy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brody, for uh, that summary, and thank you for your uh, efforts in Brussels on our behalf, notwithstanding the loss of your briefcase. Um, I, I had a, an email on Sunday from some gentleman who said he had lost his briefcase or had it stolen in Cyprus, and could I give him any tips on what he should do? Well, <laughs> I, I, I have to say that I, immediately I've advised the the authorities here to uh, engage in case he's got his hands on some of my papers. I'm sorry, asking you, but I, I would say that I would say that there are actually two copies of the of the renewables report in the briefcase, which shows you, you know, how exciting it is that people will actually go and steal it. Clearly that is what they were after. Yeah. Uh, right, does anybody have any questions for Chick or any points they want to make uh, on this paper? Alison. It's more a question about the paper, and it may, not, it may be more of a, a question for Jane. The proposals, um, I just want to understand the difference between uh, committees agreed action, the difference between monitoring and a watching brief recommended. You know, proposal... Proposal 8, um, you know, which talks about opportunities to uh, regarding production of unconventional gas, clearly it, not something that I support, and, but, but that isn't what this discussion is about. I just want to know why a watching brief is recommended there, whereas when we look at proposal number 5 on energy policy, it says the committee should monitor in the context of our work on energy policy. It, are we basically saying the same thing there? Are we going to keep the same... Are, are we going to keep an eye on both developments to the same extent? I think the, the, the issue, and Jane will come in, or you might come in, I think the, the question is, you know, to determine action on all eight proposals would mean that we, you know, it'd be more than a full-time you know, function. What we've, we've done is, is look at the proposal that we, we have to make sure that class will, will monitor and that, that if there's any critical, I will feed back to the committee. Um, but we chose the two particularly that we we uh, decided to do more than just monitor, but actually engage as a recommendation to the to the European Commission. Is that fair? Yeah, indeed. I, I mean, I think in, in terms of the language, that I mean, you're absolutely right, Alison. There's not an awful lot of difference between monitoring and uh, keeping a watching brief. Um, I mean, the, the point the point Chick made uh, is a very fair one, which is in terms of the the work of this committee, there's only a limited amount of resource that we have. Um, to uh, follow uh, this broad range of uh, policy areas, and therefore, what the paper is trying to do is, is identify where the priority should be in terms of our, our our workload. It's entirely up to the committee members to decide whether this set of proposals is the correct one, um, whether this is what we want to do. Uh, it's also worth saying that any EU legislation that's relevant to any of these areas will uh, be flagged up to the committee via the, the European uh, reporter. So we will get plenty of notice in advance of anything that's coming that might be relevant. I just wanted to check that by we've got to keep an eye on it. I think it's a very good point. And I think if something of significance, as we monitor this and, and we're watching brief, uh, that we're duty bound to at least raise it with the committee. And if we feel that any uh, further action needs to be taken, then we, we should certainly do that through the through the uh, committee and, as I said, with further interaction with you. Mark, Thank you. Um, 
on the SMEs, and I just wonder, uh, should we write as a committee, I don't know what the, the actual procedure is for this, but should we be writing as a committee to the Scottish Government, a uh, Cabinet Secretary, you know, to say just what is being done, can we do more to promote the, the SMEs, make it, be, you know, this funding, oh, the awareness of this funding to SMEs, uh, and also should, you know, through the banks, should be, be right. I mean, I think Chick said that he'd been speaking to banks. Well, surely it should be through the committee. Um, well, and I agree, if I may, and seek the committee's agreement. I think uh, in approaching the Cabinet Secretary, you know, part of the rationale, and I, I take the point, that the committee might want at some stage to write to the banks, but uh, I think we need more information before we can actually see the Cabinet Secretary formally. Here's what we might want to... Uh, to do. I mean, this represented a 40 minute, three quarters of an hour meeting. So, uh... you, I mean, you, I mean, just picking up Margaret's point, I mean, you are already just planning to discuss this with the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, okay. But, but we need more information, yeah. certainly, that would yeah. be brought back to the committee as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Sir, because they may be working on that. They might give us information that well, helps us make a decision. They might already be aware and have things in train. Right. Um, it seems a bit daft. That, you know. Forgive me. I, I, maybe I should have expanded. I mean, the rationale for me talking to, to, to other bodies is just to try and discern who knows what and uh, <laughs> information I've got so, so far in terms of discussions through, through the, the civil servants and, and the banks is that there is very little awareness of the, of the, the particular access to finance programme. Uh, certainly, um, we do not have a small business envoy, unless somebody can not nominate or name who they are. Um, and there has been no, um, and I think that would be a proposal. The proposal should actually, I, th I would suggest, that ultimately go from the, from the Cabinet Secretary to the, uh, to the Director General, you know, asking you know, for panels and business envoys, etc. Well, can I, can I suggest um, that, that you, you, you continue to, to work on this and, and report back to us on where these discussions are going? Because I think, I mean, I think the point that, that, that both Rhoda and Margaret have raised is a very fair one. You know, there is there is this lot of money available. People are not aware of it, and and it's it's perhaps unfortunate that you know Scottish small and medium-sized enterprises are, are are losing out. But I think we need more information. So if you can if you can report back to the committee, that would be very helpful. Okay. Okay, anything else somebody wants to raise on this? Okay, in that case, can we agree, therefore, um, the recommendations which are on page two to adopt the priorities um, in Annex A and forward these to the European and External Committee that the European reporter continues to uh, monitor the developments in the EU policy makings uh, and report back and that we'll continue to consider any relevant EU issues um, uh, going forward. Are we happy to agree with that? Yeah, agreed. Okay, thank you. Right, and with that, we move into private session. <laughs>